Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Welcome to this webinar under the Expert Speaker Series organized by the Hong Kong Academy of Finance and Hong Kong Institute for Monetary and Financial Research. I am Casey Kwok, Chief Executive Officer of the Academy. I shall be the moderator for today. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Welcome to this webinar under the Expert Speaker Series organized by the Hong Kong Academy of Finance and Hong Kong Institute for Monetary and Financial Research. I am Casey Kwok, Chief Executive Officer of the Academy. I shall be the moderator for today. Today's webinar will be conducted in Putonghua with simultaneous interpretation in English. The language selection button is right below the webcast screen. Before we begin today's seminar, let me remind you of a few rules. We will be recording today's lecture, and the video will be uploaded to the Hong Kong Academy of Finance's website and YouTube channel. We have set aside time for a Q&A session, where you can submit your questions in the Q&A box on the right side of the screen. The views and discussions in today's seminar are the personal views of the participants and guests and do not represent the views of their respective organizations nor the views of the Hong Kong Monetary Authority, the Hong Kong Academy of Finance and the Hong Kong Institute for Monetary and Financial Studies or their boards of directors. The topic of today's webinar is the latest macroeconomic developments, the tightening of monetary policy by the Fed, and offshore RMB market development. We are very honored to have Mr. Joseph Yam, former chief executive of the Hong Kong Monetary Authority, and Professor Huang Yiping, deputy dean of the National School of Development of Peking University to discuss these topics together. Uh, Mr. Yam, greetings. Professor Huang, greetings. Mr. Yam is a fellow of the Academy of Finance and a distinguished fellow of the Lao Chua Tech Institute of Global Economics and Finance at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. He was the first chief executive of the Hong Kong MA, and during his tenure, he laid the foundation for a robust Hong Kong dollar-linked exchange rate system that has allowed the Hong Kong dollar exchange rates and interest rates to remain very stable over a long period of time. Professor Huang served as a member of the Monetary Policy Committee of the People's Bank of China from 2015 to 2018. Now we will begin our webinar. Mr. Yam, Professor Huang, let us first talk about the inflation and interest rate hike issues, which are of concern in the market. Well, because of pressure, um, the, the Fed has entered a rate hike cycle due to inflationary pressure. Some in the financial markets worried that the Fed raises the interest rate too late and too slowly. And then the inflation in the U.S. may be rising faster and uh, will last a longer time because of a number of different concerns. Right now, inflation in the U.S. is 7 to 8 percent, but the uh, U.S. federal fund rate is currently only 0 0.5 percent. So I want to ask, uh, I want to start from Mr. Yam. So what do you think will be the outlook for U.S. interest rate hike? Well, to be... Um, to say for sure, if you talk about uh, the Federal Reserve, well, their statutory obligation is low inflation rate. And right now, inflation rate is so high. And then they also have the responsibility of low unemployment rate, but unemployment rate is higher now. And if they only start to hike rate now, it is too late and too slowly. But I think that there are reasons behind. The first reason is I think they are worried that interest hike will affect financial stability. That may lead to some systemic problems and financial crisis. As you know, over a long period of time, there was low interest rates and there was adequate liquidity because of quantitative easing. So in the market, prices went up uh, a lot. If you look at traditional assets like equities, 
Well, PE is at historical high level. Besides, there are many uh, structural products being launched. So there are uh, collateral backed um, bonds and securities. And then during the financial crisis, uh, there was the subprime uh, crisis. Well, the products at that time were similar. And then leveraging rate is very high. Many people had taken out a lot of loans. So the Fed's first worry is that if they hike rate for too much and too fast, then market prices may come down and there would be uh, panic selling. And as a result, there might be financial crisis. The second worry is fiscal um, burden of the U.S. government. Now their debt is already uh, 30 trillion, 130% uh, uh, of GDP. So if interest rates goes up, then the Treasury's interest expense will increase by 300 billion USD. That is a big amount, 1.4% of GDP. So well, this is interest expense, but then um, whenever the interest rate goes up 1%, then the interest uh, expense will uh, be an increase of 300 billion US dollar. So actually, this is not only a burden for the US government, it is also for the whole country of the United States. Their interest expense burden will increase. Now, the US is the biggest uh, debt in debt company, a uh, country in the world. So if you look at the net international investment position, the U.S. has a total liability of 14 trillion USD. So that means they are very worried about these two things. First, financial stability, and second, uh, financial burden. So that's why they slowed down their pace of interest rate hike. They want to buy time. They want to have more time to manage market expectations in a better way, and then they can uh, taper and they can hike interest rates slowly. Now, inflation rate is already 8%. This evening, the March inflation number will be announced. So actually, they already said that it will be very high. So the official opinion is that it is going to be very high. The market expects 8.4 uh, to 9.4% in this range. So they in, uh, increase interest rates too slowly and by uh, too little. So problems are getting bigger. So I believe that this interest hike period will be long. So they hope to avoid financial crisis. Well, I believe that there is big chance of seeing stagflation in the U.S. So apart from interest hike, the U.S. also wants to uh, taper. That means to shrink the balance sheet. So what will be the impact on the liquidity of the financial market? Well, the impact is going to be big. Right now, the balance sheet is 9 trillion. In 2007, at the end of 2007, before the financial crisis, the balance sheet was almost 1 trillion, now 9 trillion. So in order to restore the normal position, we are talking about a big tapering. And this is not easy. Because if they taper, that means they need to sell things that they had bought. So when things mature, well, they will uh, get back the money. They no longer will make further purchase. As a result, there will be impact on asset price in the market. Well, Professor Huang, concerning U.S. interest hike outlook, what do you think? And of course, China has different situation. Later on, we will talk more about China. I strongly agree with Mr. Yam and his views 
and his judgment concerning the Fed's interest hike. Well, this year, people are worried about the U.S. and advanced countries, that there may be the risk of stagflation. I think this is worth our attention and concern because inflation is already quite high now and the Fed sees big pressure to hike interest rates. And then the Ukraine situation also may cause impact on the commodities market. And various countries' inflationary pressure will also increase. As a result, the cost of adjustment may become higher. No matter whether you look at inflationary pressure, slowing economic growth, and also monetary policy adjustment, and also the point made by Mr. Yem, whether or not there will be stagflation in advanced countries. Well, Casey, you also asked Mr. Yem a question just now. Well, the Fed is going to taper. And with interest hike, will that be impact on the global market? I think we need to pay attention to this point, especially for the developing um, countries and emerging countries. The Fed is the most important central bank in the world, and USD is international reserve currency. Based on past experience, when the Fed uh, eases, uh, on average, we will see that there is more liquidity flowing into emerging countries. And in these countries, their currencies will appreciate and asset price will go up. This may be helpful to economic growth. In 2008 to 2009, we already saw that process. But when monetary policy was uh, adjusted, then that means, as Mr. Yam just said, the central bank's balance sheet uh, will see a tapering. And then as a result, global liquidity will be tighter. And developing countries may experience uh, capital outflow, depreciation of their currency, and uh, decline of asset price. In the last round of the Fed uh, adjustment that happened in 2014 to 2016, and we saw financial crisis in some emerging countries, this time what change will happen? It is difficult to tell. However, I think that capital outflow currency depreciation, asset price decline. Well, there is this risk that we should pay attention to in some emerging countries, especially for countries with not healthy economic fundamentals. For example, a big uh, deficit or over-appreciated uh, currency, economic growth not stable, very high inflation. Well, these are some poor fundamentals. And for economies with poor fundamentals, uh, when liquidity, external liquidity is tightened, then they will experience more pressure. For China, uh, let me explain briefly. I think China will experience some pressure, but overall speaking, the scale of our economy is big. We still have 3.3 trillion of uh, foreign reserve, and we have um, current account surplus up to 2% of GDP this year. And finally, we also have capital uh, control capital account control. So, of course, we need to pay attention to the risk. However, I don't think that would be a very extreme situation in China. Thank you, Professor Huang. I agree with Professor Huang very much. Just now, I talked about the U.S., and Professor Huang also talked about other markets, and that would be impact on other markets. I definitely agree. Now, another point is, Geopolitics are very um, uh, tight or in tense condition, and there are different approaches. Different economies in the world uh, have different economic systems. So there is big variance among different countries. If you compare the U.S. and China, well, for U.S., the economic recovery is happening. However, the inflation is very high. For China, economic recovery is not very big. It is acceptable. However, how much is inflation? 1%. So the latest figure is 1.5%, which was just released. So in the US, if you look at the monetary policy, that's because of their local situation, and they will in increase interest rates. And this is not appropriate for many other economies or countries. 
Now, if there is this situation in different financial markets in different places, there would be some unusual uh, volatility. For example, exchange rates, uh, capital markets, and also there is still a lot of liquidity. Investment banks will make use of the liquid capital uh, to make money outside. So in the coming period, I think it is going to be a financially volatile period. We need to pay attention to the whole world, especially within our financial system. We have to be careful with financial risk. We have to pay closer attention to that. I think there won't be problem with the mainland because in China, there is still a certain degree of uh, capital account control and these controls will be like a firewall between China and the external world. So let's say if the Fed hikes interest rates, the impact on mainland China will not be big because there is exchange control as a firewall, as a barrier. Besides, uh, China has or practices socialist economy. And so central policies, uh, execution and transmission uh, has very high efficiency. So problems can be taken care of. I am not worried about China, but I am worried about Hong Kong because Hong Kong is a very open economy. And we do not have much natural resources. We only rely on doing business with the external world. For our economy, uh, because of COVID-19, our economy is not doing well. Unlike the US, we still have not seen much economic recovery. Our inflation is not high. However, the US is going to hike interest rates. And because of the linked exchange rate system, we have to follow. So we have to handle and fight the pandemic. And we are an international city. We have to uh, adopt inbound control measures to fight the pandemic. At the same time, we have to pay attention to um, the uh, movement of talents. So in Hong Kong, the environment that we are facing is more difficult. However, we do not have external debt. I talked about net international investment uh, in a position just now. And Hong Kong, in Hong Kong, there is two or trillion USD, more or less the same as China. China also has two or trillion USD of net assets. So this two trillion is around six times of our GDP. So in other words, we have uh, we are sitting on a large amount of wealth, so to speak, so we can defend uh, the situation. So we can actually uh, continue to survive. We can ride out the difficulty, but the situation is not very satisfactory. Mr. Yam, you mentioned a few important issues just now. You talked about impact on the whole world, and then you also mentioned the Chinese economy, and also the difference uh, in the interest cycle with the US and then Hong Kong. So let's go deeper into each of these issues. If you look at China's situation right now, the Fed is in a, an interest hike cycle and China is different from the US. China wants to maintain 5.5% economic growth and they also want to stabilize employment. Now people all see monetary policy is gradually being eased. Now, if you look at the two biggest economies in the world, their monetary policies are of different direction. So there is, very, uh, there is interest rate differential and change. What will be the impact on RMB? What will be the RMB outlook this year? So uh, what will be the range of exchange rate fluctuation, Mr. Uh, Professor Huang? Well. I think the problem that you mentioned just now is quite uh, 
apparent. The Fed is going to hike rates by a large margin this year, and in China, the economy is relatively weak right now. So, as such as now, our central bank's monetary policy will have to be easing. So, we uh, the official statement is a stable monetary policy, and my interpretation is that there would be uh, loose rather loose, relatively loose monetary policy. So since last year, a number of measures were adopted already, and then uh, the measures are rather prudent. Uh, our Premier has been saying that uh, we should not uh, apply the same uh, liquidity policy all over the places. Now, if there is a reversal of interest differential, yesterday, the 10-year Treasury or national debt, there is a reversal of interest differential. So how much more relaxation will we see in China's monetary policy? And what would be the direction of capital flow? I think they will see some big impact. But at the end of the day, I agree with Mr. Yam. The Chinese economy has a big scale. Fundamentals are healthy. So I don't think that there would be a big problem. As regards exchange rates, of course, it's difficult to predict exchange rates. In the past few years, after first quarter 2020 till now, the broad direction is that the currency is appreciating. So the trend is quite clear. But how long will it continue? How long will the currency continue to appreciate? It all depends on whether the economy can stabilize. This year, if it is easy to achieve 5.5% economic growth, then I think that would be a good foundation for exchange rates. We are talking about strong economy of a, a big power, and uh, return on investment is also good. So I think there should be positive outlook on the currency. However, if you look at the margin, uh, well, this year, there is a recurrence of the pandemic and the uh, Russia-Ukraine situation will affect future inflation, especially PPI. There would be bigger impact on that. Mr. Yam said that right now PPI is very high, but CPI is very low. So I think for many um, mid to downstream enterprises, well, they see very big impact on their profit, and as a result, the economy will also be affected. Besides, there is change in interest differential between China and the Western countries, and so we need to guard against, or we have to pay attention to possible currency depreciation risk. Of course, that depreciation may not be a big one. I just said that change in currency would be such that, well, the Chinese economic growth is going to be a more important determining factor. For exchange rates, what will be its range of fluctuation? I can't really say for sure, but I can make two points. First, right now, our fluctuation is a managed one. And in the past one to two years, the central bank did not interfere, interfere with the exchange rate level. So the market is um, playing its role. But it doesn't mean that the exchange rate is totally free. It is, free, it is not really free-floating entirely. So there is still control. Now, if the fluctuation in exchange rate becomes very big, then the central bank and the authority may put in place measures to stabilize the exchange rates and the market. I think uh, that can be anticipated. But how much will be the fluctuation? I can't really say for sure. Concerning RMB exchange rates, I have no worry about it at all. But there may be some adjustment because, well, interest rates in the U.S. is rising and we have still stable monetary policy. But don't forget, in terms of macroeconomic uh, measures, we have still a lot of tools that can be used. Our macroeconomy is very good. We have normal monetary policies. We don't need QE. 
We don't need a very low, ultra low interest rate. We don't need to monetize uh, fiscal uh, policies. So in terms of international payments uh, account, uh, we still have a surplus. So these factors support RMB exchange rates. In the short run, if there is adjustment, there is no problem. I, as an investor, will buy RMB. Yes, I agree. This year, there may be a new change. This year, what will be the balance in the uh, current or recurring projects? This is an uncertainty. In the past, our exports were very strong, but recently, exports uh, showed signs of weakening. And the Ukraine situation has pushed up uh, the price of energy and agricultural products, and those are our imports. So I agree with you, there won't be a big problem. However, for the uh, recurring items, I think uh, there will be some change this year. Right. That may be possible, but in the short term, if there is recurring uh, deficit, I think it is going to be a small one. Comparing with GDP, I think it will only be 2 or 3%. It is very normal, yes. But if you look at the U.S., we are not talking about 2 or 3% uh, of GDP. We are talking about 10% in terms of their recurrent item. So for our macroeconomic um, position, we are very healthy. I am not worried about our currency or exchange rate at all. I don't see there will be big depreciation pressure. Right. So going back to the point we discussed just now, right now, USD interest rate is rising, and the impact may be very big, and the impact will be in the financial market and also especially in developing countries. Some time ago, a big um, fund management company in the U.S. said that their assets under management in the world is $9 trillion USD, and if they used 1% of the assets, if they moved that amount from one place to another place, or from one asset class to another asset class, then price change uh, resulting will be very big. So in the past period, uh, globally, debts went up. So asset prices rose a lot. And now in the global financial market, volatility is something we need to pay attention to as a result, especially for places where the conditions are not very satisfactory or not very good. Of course, this will not affect global financial stability uh, but then there may be impact on China's external trade. Okay, let's talk about a new topic. Now, many people are worried about the economy and also financial um, weaponization. Weaponization, okay? So, some time ago, the IMF The first vice president, Gita Gopina, warned that in many countries and central banks, the central banks are thinking of reducing uh, foreign reserve in USD and in Euro. So this so-called weaponization and also uh, economic and financial um, tactics concerning global payment system and uh, um, and uh, for a fiscal reserve, what do you think? I think this is a big issue. Let me put it this way. I think right now, if you look at international monetary system, there are some structural problems in the world, mainly two points. First, if you look at international monetary system, it is based on sovereign currencies, for example, USD and Euro. They are medium or media of exchange and also um, 
accumulation of wealth, and they are sovereign currencies. But then monetary policies based on sovereign currencies are set by central banks based on local economic situation. They will not consider the global economic situation. So right now, the U.S. wants to hike interest rate because their inflation is high. But then in many other places in the world, they don't want to see too fast rate hike because their economy is not very healthy and not very good. The second structural problem is sovereign currency countries like the U.S., well, they have the room to make use of their currency special global status to achieve some political motives. So weaponization as you speak, as you as you mentioned. For example, USD and SWIFT. SWIFT is not a US company. It is a cooperation organization. However, there are many American banks using SWIFT. Of course, um, the U.S. has influence over it. And so as a result, there is the situation of international financial hegemony. So I think the Americans are getting uh, crazier in this regard, so to speak. Well, first of all, they put restrictions on Chinese enterprises financing um, exercise in the U.S. At the same time, Americans are not uh, really allowed to make investment in Chinese enterprises. So financing investments are all subject to uh, restriction. And then there is impact on global use of uh, international financial infrastructure, so weaponization. So some countries like Russia are not allowed to use USD or these financial infrastructure. And finally, some countries' USD assets are being frozen, including the USD reserve. So these are some crazy tactics. In the short run, the affected countries will um, come across troubles and inconvenience. However, if you look at the uh, long term, I think there will be some negative, some major negative risk for the U.S. Because if you look from another angle, now they are putting restrictions. They do not allow Americans to invest in Chinese stocks. They do not allow Chinese enterprises to do financing in the U.S. So these are like capital controls or restrictions. Let's say if they do not allow Russia or China to use USD or other financial infrastructure, is this a foreign exchange control? Besides, if the U.S. freezes some countries' USD assets or Russia's USD reserve or USD debts, then is this a, a default on the side of the U.S.? I think these moves will make some of the countries very worried. They will be worried that one day they will become the targets of these moves or tactics. So USD as an international reserve currency, I think the status in the long run will be affected. U.S. is the biggest um, country with the biggest global debt. And I think when you talk about the biggest creditor in the world, i.e. China and Hong Kong added together, well, there is $4 trillion USD of international investment capital, and U.S. is the biggest debtor with more than $14 trillion USD of net debt. Well, I think all the tactics or moves are crazy and actually stupid, in my opinion. So I hope that they will be able to see these 
problems that may happen, and uh, they can uh, do a review. I agree with Joseph a lot. I agree with Joseph's analysis. I think these are extreme measures that we are talking about, and there will be consequences arising. Recently, a lot had happened, and they actually uh, went beyond um, the um, usual logic and reasoning. Well, in the past, well, there was trade war. Uh, between the U.S. and China, and uh, many people asked whether uh, China's uh, foreign reserves will be placed in the U.S., and one day it will be con confiscated. In the past, I thought that that would not be possible, because if the U.S. does that, then um, that would be a strong blow dealt to uh, U.S. status and also USD status as an international reserve currency. So, um, Rationally speaking, that should not happen. However, it seems now that things are getting irrational. So there will be a lot of negative uh, impact in the future. I am even more pessimistic. This time, well, if we look at things that had been done, actually, uh, in the Trump administration, a lot of measures were taken about assets, and there are some move made about SWIFT and also uh, detention of some um, foreign reserve. In the past, uh, U.S. is the main defender and supplier of globalization, and now they are doing something that is totally opposite. So we are talking about a sovereign country, and it is sanctioning another country uh, with the use of some uh, common uh, public infrastructure. So we are talking about trust in uh, the U.S. ability to maintain a global order in the past, but now I think people's confidence uh, is shaking. So I think the risk is there already, if you mentioned the uh, risk about uh, foreign reserve in USD. In the past, the risk is very small, but uh, now we are seeing a change. So for the central banks and for the uh, wealthy individuals, how, are, how should they allocate their wealth and assets? This is a big issue. So it is also about the place where you are going to place your supply chain. And in the future, there will be geopolitical risk that will affect your decision. So in the past decades, well, uh, there was globalization. It may be coming to an end. I hope it is not. But if it is really coming to an end, then does that mean that in the future there will no longer be trade and investment? No. In the future, we will see some non-economic risk factors which are getting more important. So in our external uh, transactions, we have to be more careful and selective. It doesn't mean that in the future there won't be any more trade and investment, but we are going to see a new era, which may not be a good one. No matter what era we are talking about, Professor, at present, I think that what our country should do is to internationalize RMB further and faster. And there should be less reliance on USD. There should be less reliance on uh, international financial infrastructure, which is um, greatly influenced by the US. If one day, if the US is saying that uh, all Chinese banks cannot use those infrastructure, then what should be done? Yes, true. Now, if you look at mainland uh, financial system under that framework, can other countries or organizations use the system? I think that is most important. I think definitely our country needs to expedite RMB internationalization. 20 years ago, uh, that work started and I think progress was too slow in the past 20 years. But right now, I think there is big need to internationalize RMB. Yes, 
Let me supplement. I agree with you, totally. In the future, for international financial infrastructure and rules and、uh, order, there will be new needs. And in China, I think work has to be done in the future. I agree that we need to expedite RMB internationalization. In the 14th five-year plan, there is the mention that RMB internationalization should be、uh, proceeded with. I want to make a point. I don't know whether you agree or not. Recently, because of the conflict between Russia and Ukraine, and Russia is being sanctioned. And many people said that RMB internationalization sees a good opportunity. I agree. If there is the chance, we can go abroad. But then, for RMB internationalization or building an international payment system or internationalization of our financial system, I hope that we should be facing the whole world. Of course. As developing countries or emerging countries,、uh, well, we should do more in those countries. This is normal. We need to develop together. However, what I don't want to see is now, given this conflict, we need to build a system. But I don't want that system to only be used by a small number of countries like Iran, Russia, and North Korea. I think we have to be very careful with that type of internationalization. We need to build a really、um, global international financial system. Yes, I totally agree with you on this point. What we are talking about here is international monetary system, and how should it be reformed? As I said just now, the structural problem. Is that the international monetary system is based on sovereign currencies, and some countries would like to politicize and weaponize the international financial infrastructure. I think these two structural problems need to be solved. Of course, in the past, there were people who proposed some reform、uh, plans, and、uh, for example. Past governor of the central bank had once said that he hoped that non-sovereign currencies can be used for the international monetary system. So SBR, IMF, SDR. However, it's difficult because under the IMF, only the U.S. mainly the U.S. has say. So, if the direction of reform is to promote non-sovereign、uh, currency to be used in international monetary system, it seems that、uh, this direction departs from political reality. It would be very difficult. So, I think international monetary system should be、uh, diversified and multipolar. It should not be only one currency. It should not be only USD. There should not be dominance of one currency. So people can be given a choice. For example, USD, Euro, RMB. So this should be the direction. And then for financial infrastructure, I hope that there can be an international consensus. These should not be politicized. These should not be、um, subject to all those weapons or tactics, right? I think in the future there should be some super sovereign currencies、uh, to be designed, and together with RMB internationalization. Mr. Joe referred to the functions of SDR. Actually, some time ago under IMF, a study group was established to see whether SDR functions can be expanded. And at that time, the chief economist Murray Opsvelt of the IMF、uh, led that group, and I was the advisor of that study group. I have、uh, served for one year, and then uh, after uh, after some time, a letter was sent to us asking us to stop our work because、uh, the U.S. was against that. Right? We need to、uh, take that out step by step. 
respect to Hong Kong, development of Hong Kong as an offshore RMB centre. Well, in the past, well, uh, there was some hope to RMB, there was some help to RMB internationalisation. Given the current situation, what should we do? Well, my view is this. In China, on the mainland, Now, China still needs uh, capital control or capital project control. This is to ensure financial stability. That's one thing. Besides, on the international level, we need to communicate with the external world so that investment funds can go abroad and organizations that need financing can also go outside for financing. So this is external circulation. There's the need for such external circulation. After considering these two needs, I think we should make good use of an offshore RMB center or market in Hong Kong. That is the one in Hong Kong. So now we should take a big step forward in Hong Kong's offshore RMB market, I think RMB should be more used in capital market, for example, stock market, uh, quotation, transaction, settlements. In these areas, RMB can be used more. So from recurring projects to capital market and to the outsiders, well, they will see that RMB is not only a transaction currency or transaction medium on the international level, level, it is also a currency for storage of wealth on the international level. I think this step should be taken faster. Professor Huang, your views, please. I agree with Joseph. I agree with him 100% on this point. In the past few years, actually, I communicated with Joseph on this point a number of times and our views are the same. My view is Hong Kong is already an international financial center and when we are internationalizing RMB and the Chinese market, I think we should uh, make good use of this opportunity. My expectation about the Hong Kong market is that it should be the most important international financial center of China. And it should also be the biggest RMB financial center in the world. Okay. Now, we have uh, talked for quite some time already. We need to uh, reserve some time for Q&A uh, by the participants. So now we will move on to Q&A now. Now, um, I would like to invite uh, Ms. Gao Min uh, to ask a question. Uh, she is Chairman and Executive Director of ICBC. Thank you, Casey. Thank you, Mr. Yam and Professor Huang for your excellent remarks. Well, a lot of information has been shared. Your points are all very constructive. Thank you very much. So concerning offshore RMB bond markets, well, development of the offshore RMB bond market all along, it is an important driving force for internationalization of RMB. In recent years, RMB um, offshore RMB bond market is developing fast in Hong Kong, especially in 2021. Um, the um, RMB, offshore RMB bond issuance uh, was up 35% in Hong Kong, much faster than uh, the issue of USD, Euro, European and Japanese currency bonds. If you look at the total inventory in 2021 at the end, a Hong Kong offshore RMB bond uh, outstanding balance only accounted for 9.9% of uh, the overall bond market in the same period. So that means that there is still broad room for development. All along, well, if you look at ICBC, well, we have got a lot of support from our group um, in issuing RMB bond. And as issuer and investor, we also take active part in Hong Kong RMB bond market transaction and issuance. My question is, right now, we are still under the impact of COVID-19, geopolitical conflict, and also the tightening uh, of the Fed. So there is stronger stagflation pressure 
are in global economic recovery. And then there is big volatility in the financial markets. So we are all concerned about the impacts of these factors on the future development of Hong Kong offshore RMB bond markets. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Yam and Professor Huang. Joseph? Right. Regarding the development of the bond market, in the past, development was good. For RMB bond demand, definitely there is the demand. I myself also hope to buy some RMB bonds. I have RMB deposits. I use RMB deposits to buy these bonds. And on the retail level, I hope that there can be some convenient arrangements to facilitate RMB uh, retail investors to buy RMB bonds. But in terms of supply, for example, PBOC and other uh, financial regulators, we hope that they will allow more organizations and local governments to come to Hong Kong to issue more RMB bonds. I think there is the demand. Besides, in the long run, I am positive about RMB. I am very positive about RMB as an international currency or an investment currency. I'm sure there is the demand. And now, for external investors, perhaps it is because of COVID-19 and geopolitical issues. Well, they may have some reservations, but in the long run, RMB, as well, China being the biggest economy in the world in a few years, and, and RMB is the currency of the biggest economy in the world, definitely there is demand for RMB. I'm not worried. In the short run, there may be geopolitical issues and impacts, and uh, there may be some negative impact. But in the long run, I am not worried at all. I think the next step to develop RMB offshore market is that we hope RMB can be used in the capital market. Let's say in Hong Kong, stock market. There are 60 odd uh, stocks uh, within Hang Seng Index. If RMB can be used to quote and to do transaction, and, and if RMB can be used for clearance, then for the 60 odd uh, Hang Seng composite stocks, for a uh, foreign investor, well, these are regarded as RMB assets. They have demand for RMB assets. If we take this step, then in the offshore market, there would be a large amount of RMB assets arising. So I think we should take this step faster. If there is no other supplement, then now let's take the next question. Mr. Adrian Lee, co-chief executive of Hong Kong BEA, Bank of East Asia. Thank you. Well, my question is about future challenge on RMB and also future obstacles. For RMB internationalization, that means that there would be more and more frequent uh, funds flowing in and going out of China. And given the current volatile situation globally, how will PBOC and SAFE um, going to uh, protect the stability of uh, our country's financial system? If you talk about maintaining financial stability, if you talk about uh, capital flow, I think that is the most important factor, and that is our economic fundamentals. This year, in the short run, can we stabilize economic growth very quickly? I think for a superpower, for a big market, I think its currency is very important. However, if there is really some big shock, we have many tools to use. For example, in 2015, the 811, uh, exchange rate reform, 
the central bank adopted a number of measures to stabilize the foreign exchange market, including using foreign reserve to intervene in the market to stabilize the exchange rate at the same time. Some measures were adopted to strengthen cross-border capital flow. As said just now, we still have uh, controls over capital items. So if there is big inflow and outflow, that uh, seriously affect uh, the stability of exchange rate, then in fact, we have a lot of tools to use. But I tend to believe that for mainland China at present, can macroeconomy stabilize concerning current foreign exchange and asset price and investor confidence, whether well, importance is much uh, higher than other short-term factors. Thank you, Professor Huang. Can I supplement? Yes. Adrian, uh, you are a banker. I think you should know that in the foreign exchange market every day, when things are open, the turnover is really very huge. BIS has once published a study. The daily turnover in the exchange rate market, well, not over 95 percent, is not it does not reflect international economy. For example, um, import export needs. So, so in fact. Uh, a lot are about speculation. Now, there are so much uh, liquid funds in the world, and when it, uh, when it comes to um, speculation, I think uh, this is not controllable. So I think convertible, convertibility is uh, correct. Uh, but then we should not allow free entirely free convertibility, because if it is 100% free, freely convertible, now 95% of the turnover can push the exchange rate to a very extreme level. So the exchange rate can totally depart from the economy fundamentals. So I think that the mainland should maintain certain degree of capital control. But that's one thing. Well, when it comes to um, market access or financial channels, uh, investment channels, there should be diversification of these channels. This is also a need. And with these two needs, I think the offshore market in Hong Kong should be uh, used more. Right, I agree. Thank you. Next, let's invite uh, from BBVA. Um, Chief Economist for Asia, Mr. Xia Le, please. Thank you. Thank you, moderator, and thank you, uh, speakers, for your very interesting discussion. I have learned a lot. My question is about the Belt and Road Plan of China. At the beginning, you said you talked about uh, the Fed's tightening of monetary policies, and recently there was the conflict between Russia and Ukraine. As a result, energy price is at a high, agricultural product price is at a high. And so um, this has actually heightened the difficulty faced by developing countries. Many developing countries face very severe debt problem. And then if you consider our Belt and Road Plan, these developing countries are treated as our partners under the Belt and Road Plan. Well, our country uh, financial institutions and our government, how can they uh, solve these risks concerning the Belt and Road? And then um, what role should the government and uh, private companies play? Professor, well, let me uh, give a few points. I'm not an expert in this area. I think there are two issues here. First, why do we introduce the Belt and Road Plan? What are the final objectives that we want to achieve? If you look at the current economic development of China, well, China wants to cooperate with more developing countries so that we can co-develop in the future. I think this is the right direction. And if we can grow together, I think it is something really very good. But then on the other hand, 
in the actual process of implementation in the future, we may be we may have to pay more attention to commercial sustainability and financial risk. And there are some projects which are of strategic meaning, and some are about government behaviors. Some are actually uh, policy financial services of governments, and some are actually a kind of aid or uh, assistance. So in the long run, if you talk about good economic cooperation and exchange, it should be built on commercial viability where risk should be controllable. And you um, mentioned a number of issues. I think various sectors uh, and departments need to think, uh, find, of, find their own solutions. I can't really comment on the actual uh, solution for each uh, organization. But overall speaking, I think in terms of the broad strategy, well, the direction is correct, and there, should, there is some good prospect from it. But then in the process, we have to uh, consider uh, whether the risks are controllable, and we need to consider also commercial sustainability. Well, we have received a lot of other questions from audiences, but because of time, we have to take the last question now. This question is from Tina Tiao from Thomson Reuters. Well, in March, all of a sudden, there was the pandemic outbreak. As a result, a big shadow was cast over the Chinese economy. And the uh, blow uh, continued in uh, April. It may also affect Q2 economy. Do you think the Chinese economy will introduce bigger stimulus and support measures? If so, what kind of measures will they be? This year, do you think the 5.5% growth targets can be achieved? I think, well, so let me go first. Yes, yes, please go ahead. I think 5.5% is a target set by us. And now there are really some challenge. If you consider policies in the past, when there is big economic downturn pressure, then the macroeconomic policies will first be affected. Of course, there is some room in the monetary policy. However, if the Fed increases interest rate a lot, then uh, it will be uh, impacted. We have a lot of expectation about fiscal policy. Well, when the economy is not doing well, well, the monetary policy can give a certain uh, boost. And uh, when will there be some new measures to be introduced? Well, I can't, I can't say for sure. It is up to the regulator, the policymakers to decide. But then I think the important point will be about investment, especially government investment. So, for example, new infrastructure, green development, digital economy, and uh, people's livelihood, low carbon economy. I think in the future, if there are new investments in these areas, I think these are something that we can anticipate if we really need more investment and more measures to stabilize growth. On the other hand, I think uh, there is something that we do have a need, but we don't know whether it will be done. Now the pandemic has been with us for a long time, and SMEs have experienced much difficulty. For the low-income earning families in China, they also suffered from a lot of difficulty. So if we are to increase fiscal expenditure, can we offer some money to um, members of the public to help them ride out the difficulties? That is my recommendation, but I don't know whether that will be done. Thank you, Professor Huang. Uh, because of time constraints, we will have to end the webinar here. Once again, let's thank Professor Huang and Mr. Yem, and uh, thank you for their uh, excellent sharing and discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much. I also need to thank members of the Academy for joining our webinar today. Uh, the next event will be on the 3rd of May. It is going to be a talk or a lecture um, to be conducted by a Nobel laureate, uh, Mr. Professor Michael Spence. If you are interested, uh, please keep an eye on the economies or on the Academy's website and LinkedIn account. And you can also scan the QR code on the screen. Then you can follow the Academy and the Hong Kong Institute for Monetary and Financial Studies. You, you'll be able to know um, the uh, coming events. Thank you. Goodbye.